thanks for joining us. This is kind of kind of exciting to be doing this. It's like being at the air show and not having to travel. So um, appreciate you guys for coming and being the guinea pigs here on this this first one. And it's it's kind of nice. I was worried that that there might be a full full room here and it might get a little little difficult to figure out um, who who to who's asking questions next and so on. So. Um, this will be fun, and yeah, as Bill said, we're going to go over um, some real basic questions that that beginners have. Uh, maybe you guys have already gone through this, um, but we'll have more of these hangouts in the future too. Um, but go over a couple of those questions, and and maybe give you even some tips on how to uh, answer questions for your friends when they're they're going through this and and getting started too. So um, some about compressors and air and then some about riveting. So we're going to break, we decide to break it into two different sections so that um, we can go over compressors and air hoses and then we can uh, stop for questions, ask questions pertaining to that and then go over the, the rivet set things that I wanted to discuss. Um, ask questions on that and then if we have time left over we can just have it open for, for more questions. So to get started um, the first thing I had was uh, on my list here was tank size, horsepower, and CFM. I'm going to share a screen here with you. So this this is just a picture I pulled off of I think it was Craftsman's website of a, a small air compressor with a small tank. This this air compressor you can kind of see on the on the top. Uh, let me get my mouse in the right spot. On the top here, it says 150 psi. Wow, you know, it's that's that's what they're touting about this. So this compressor is is I shouldn't I should have mentioned horsepower too. This compressor is 0.8 horsepower, and it will produce about two and a half cfm uh, cubic feet per minute at 90 psi. When you're looking at air compressors, you want to make sure you look at the cubic feet a minute at a specific psi. All air tools except paint guns are designed to run at 90 psi. So um, that's why we want to look at the 90 to 100 psi range. Now what they're saying by this 150 psi is pretty much the compressor just keeps chunking along until it gets to 150 psi before it kicks out. And what they're doing there is they're 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 accomplishing it just a little bit more by, by putting a little bit more air in that tank at a higher pressure, but it really works the compressor hard to do it. And these compressors are um, an oilless type compressor, which are traditionally very, very noisy. Um, so what we want to do is we want to separate the tank size and the compressor and think of them as two different things. We want to think about this as a battery charger and the tank as a battery. So if I go to our next page here, this is a 60 gallon Ingersoll Rand and this happens to be a belt driven oil uh, uh, oil lubricated pump. Um, but they could actually put that same compressor as on the last uh, photo on the top of this big tank. And it would still be putting in two and a half CFM. It would still be 0.8 horsepower. Um, but your battery is bigger. So it's going to take a long, long time to charge, but then it'll take a lot less time in between uh, each charge. So that's those are the kind of things to look at. Most people, and I don't think I grabbed a photo of the uh, like 20 to 30 gallon tanks. Most people... A 20 to 30 gallon tank works quite well uh, to do the the things that builders do because it's it's enough volume that it's not running constantly, but um, it's small enough that you can take it out to the hangar when it when it's time to assemble uh, assemble the airplane, and then you can have it out there. So. Um, anyway, that's that's the tank size. So you can go anywhere from from a two gallon up to a sixty gallon tank, it, uh, eighty gallon tank. It, it doesn't really matter. But the larger the tank is, the longer the compressor will run, and then the longer in between it running. So then, when we look at the charger, the the uh, the compressor on top, again the the oilless type make a lot of noise, probably three times as much noise as an oil filled type, so you have to listen to that racket for a long time. Um, let me switch to another screen here, sorry. I couldn't get this picture that I wanted to save to work correctly. Um, 
And I apologize, we're, we're learning this technology as we're going here today. Even this morning, we didn't, we weren't quite sure what we were doing yet. So, okay, so here is a picture of an oil filled type, which are going to be the most quiet again. And this is uh, a larger pulley here on a smaller pulley on the motor. So this is going to run, uh, the, the average size like this will probably put out 11 to 14 CFM, cubic feet a minute, um, while it's compressing. Most air tools only need 3 to 5 CFM to run. So if you wanted to have no tank on the compressor and just have the compressor start when you pull the trigger of the drill or rivet gun, um, you would want like a 5 CFM compressor. That would keep up with you. You could work all day long and not have, not have any trouble with it, but the compressor is going to run all day long. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. This, uh, this compressor is a twin head, so it compresses the, the air once in one cylinder, and then the high pressure or the mid pressure air goes to the second cylinder and compresses it again. One thing that you can do with these compressors that most people uh, don't do, but it's, it's certainly possible, is you can put a larger pulley on the motor itself and slow it down. So you can take an 11 CFM compressor, slow it down so that it's only making 6 CFM, for instance, by just changing the pulley in the belt. And that makes it very much quieter. So that's a little trick. And then also, if you look for a compressor that has these pipe fittings that go into the uh, muffler, they call it, about 60% of the noise from the air compressor is generated from this intake right here. So what we've actually done with our compressor in our shop is we've taken these pipe fittings and we've ran them out through the wall and then screwed the intake on outside under a little doghouse that we built on the side of the building. And again, that you're you're sharing 60% of the noise then with your neighbor, and you only have to listen to 40% of it. So that's a little trick while you're looking for air compressors to see if that's that's available. And then the next thing would just be to build a soundproofing box around the compressor. You have to have enough airflow around it to keep it cool, but any line of sight um, barrier that you can put on quiets it down quite a bit. So that's what I wanted to share about compressors and choosing compressors. And again, we'll have questions at the end, so if you, if you have any, any questions, um, maybe write them down or, or put them in the chat box so that, um, so that we can get to them. Hey, the, Mike. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, it's Bill. Uh, I just want to interrupt really quickly. I know um, I put myself in a precarious situation a few weeks ago by um, asking you a question about um, which air compressor I should buy if I wanted to um, test out some some drills. And I know I said, well, just exactly what you talked about. Oh, there's this, you know, Porter cable that's, you know, a couple hundred dollars. Would that suffice? And I think um, maybe if you could just give a tip, a, a real basic tip on what the, what the base price range and what the base um, requirements for a, a good air compressor to start might be, that'd be helpful. Okay. Just because you have the buttons doesn't mean you get to interrupt with questions. You <laughs> <laughs> All right. So 3 to 5 CFM is what you're looking for at 90 PSI, and it may be at 100 PSI. They, they rate them all different, so you can't figure it out. And, and one thing I mentioned is horsepower. You want to completely ignore horsepower because a Chinese motor is going to draw way more amperage than a nice U.S. motor. And the horsepower is just a direct calculation off the amount of amperage it uses. So, um, so ignore the horsepower, 3 to 5 CFM at 90 PSI for the compressor head. And then the tank, however big a tank you want, but um, 30 gallon, 20 to 30 gallon usually works pretty well um, for, for most builders. And, and that's, that's usually a wheeled unit, so you can you know, put it in the truck and take it out to the airport and and uh, use it that way. So what are you going to spend um, four to six hundred dollars maybe? Um, there, there's so many options. Um, you can go into the uh, the wrong names coming to my head. I can't think of it. There's a there's a book of like farm implement type stuff that they sell pretty good quality stuff and you can buy your own compressor head and you can put it on a propane tank and you can, you can build a compressor for $200. Uh, 
Um, so there, there's a lot of options. Um, let me move on to location. Again, if you're going to be working in your garage and you have an outbuilding that you can put the air compressor in, you're going to have a lot nicer environment to work in. And that leads me into a couple accessories that um, I wanted to talk about. Let me figure out how to share the right screen again. Okay, so these pictures are not in order, so please bear with me. Whoops. And I'm not on the right screen. All right, so one of the things that we sell is what's called a rapid air kit. And it, if you're familiar with PEX plumbing, it's very similar to water plumbing with PEX. But you just you just plug these things in. You literally cut the tube off with the, this tubing cutter that's shown here and you stuff it into these connectors and it has an o-ring and a, a stainless biting ring in there so it can't pop back out and it's sealed that's just, that's it you just plug it together you give it a little tug and it's done and so you can mount um, connectors on your walls anywhere you want it's a pretty slick way to do that you can put it behind the wall you can put it on top of the wall surface mount um, but it beats running a hose that you're always tripping on over to your work area uh, the next thing I wanted to show, we spent so much time working out technical bugs this morning that I don't have these things in the right order. I'm not, not even sure I have a picture of it. Just a sec here. Okay, I don't, but I'll show you one live here in just a minute. This is our lightweight air hose kit, and I'll show you again in a live shot why, why we like that. But we have one of these that has three different hoses you can mount to the bottom of the bench. And it's just, it's very nice for getting the air over to where you're working and then have, uh, with a large hose, and then have lightweight whip hoses coming off of that. Um, something <clears throat> right after the air compressor is the filter regulator. Um, this is a picture of a filter and regulator built in one. So the bottom of it is a, a screening device where it takes out particles and moisture out of the air coming out of the compressor. Because when the compressor runs, it makes it hot. When it goes into the tank, it cools off rapidly and, and gets a lot of water in it, if you're in a human place like we are anyway. And so this water will drip out of the bottom when you release it out of this particular regulator. Again, this is not something we sell, but it's something that everybody needs. And then on top is a pressure regulator. Again, we set our shop pressure to 90 PSI, and we leave it there. We never change it. Now, there's also a lot of questions I get about lubrication. <clears throat> you want to have air tool oil in your tools, and some people want to put in a lubricator. I'm not a big fan. I know a lot of shops, uh, especially professional shops, do this so that their employees can't ruin their tools. But... Um, I don't like it because when you unplug the hose, there's air, there's oil in the hose, and it drains back out, makes a mess. Um, so instead, let me switch back to. I'm not used to talking this much. Sorry. <clears throat> so I'm going to switch to my detail camera here. And okay, so when you're done using the tool, it says. Uh, every ins air tool instruction you get will say, oil the tool before you use it. I do it backwards. When I'm done using the tool, I put a couple drops of air tool oil in the inlet, and I plug the coupler back on, and then I just pull the trigger a couple times to throw the oil through, <coughs> through the uh, tool, and then it's oiled for next time, so you don't have to oil it before use. But it displaces any water that you might have gotten in there while you're using it. So that's how I handle the oiling, and that way it doesn't um, drain back all over the floor here. Um, okay, I'm running short on time, aren't I? So I wanted to show a couple more things about pressure versus, versus flow. <clears throat> Again, we run 90 PSI all the time, so that's 90 PSI all the way up to the drill or the rivet gun. And then we use an airflow restrictor at the base of the tool. This one is a swivel restrictor and you can see how that cuts off the air flow. So it's actually seeing 90 PSI on that back side of this, but it's only able to use so many CFM based on where you set this. <clears throat> that is a quarter turn from full off to full on. And then this one is more like a needle valve. 
uh, where you can turn it in several turns from full off to full on. So this is the type that we use on the rivet gun where we really want to regulate it. Um, generally, I don't regulate a drill at all. Um, now that we're on this camera, let me pull over here. This is, first of all, this is this drill set up with a normal quick disconnect connector. And you can see when you put a nice lightweight tool on the end of this normal coupler and a heavy hose, you've doubled the length of, of stuff you have. So a lot of people will put on a swivel here that makes it um, articulate more. Instead, we like to use our lightweight hose kit, which has a much smaller coupler. And the hose is so flexible, you really don't need the swivel, which takes even more weight off of your tool. So there's your side-by-side -side comparison using um, different vintages of the same drill. Uh, how much how much more flexible it is you get here, and then to further that lightweight hose kit, we have a manifold. And this is kind of a mess because it just came off the bottom of this table. But you plug your heavy hose in here. This is screwed to the table, and then you can plug up to this one's up to four. But normally we we just have a manifold with up to three hoses that come off. That way you can have one for a drill, one for a rivet gun, and one for a blow gun or something. So you don't have to keep switching tools back and forth. Hey, Mike, I'm yep. going to interrupt uh, because I do have the buttons. I will interrupt one more time and just let people know uh, if you joined late, there's a chat window on the left-hand side of the screen. If you have questions, please um, take a second and open the chat window and go ahead and send us whatever questions you have, and we'll be sure to get them answered. And we are ready for questions, too. So um, did, we, did we have any typed in the side yet? Uh, no questions yet. Well, um, I see that we have a few more people that have joined, so we can either take questions through chat or we can unmute you um, to be able to do that. Any downside to running the pressure wide open above 90 PSI? Um, the air tools are just designed to run at 90, so um, I generally don't do that. Um, once in a while, if I have a, uh, die grinder or something that's just not getting the power that I quite need. Um, I'll cheat a little, but I try not to do that because you're you're abusing the tool. I I really in my mind equate a lot um, electricity to airflow. So you wouldn't you wouldn't be running your hand electric drill and go oh, it's just not doing the job. I'm going to go over and turn the turn the voltage up on my my system because you know it's going to burn it up. The air is going to do the same thing. Finishing edges of skins. Um, let's hold that question mark until the last. Um, we're we're going to try and cover uh, questions on air, plumbing, uh, things like that, and then we will um, just take open questions. Well, we're going to do air, and then we're going to do rivet sets, and then we're going to take open questions. So. And, Mike, I'll just uh, mention one more thing. If there's anybody watching live um, on the YouTube channel, please... Uh, Go ahead and um, submit your questions on the Google Plus page for the event, and we'll be sure to get them answered as well if you can make your way back there. And I think if, you're, if your camera's on and you want to talk, well, I don't know, Bill, you, you know the rules about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, we'll, we'll wait until the end um, to do live questions if anybody wants to show their beautiful faces and um, we'll, we'll, get you, we'll get you switched on. Okay. Well, if there's no more questions about air, I will move on to the rivet sets. So just give a couple more seconds to see if anybody has typed anything and needs to hit the enter key. Okay. Well, the next um, group of things I wanted to talk about is is rivet sets, and so the again we're we're trying to focus this hangout on things that people ask me a lot on the phone. New builders ask a lot, <clears throat> and one of those is about the flush set. Let me s switch again views. Well, bear with me. 
Okay, so <clears throat> this is a set that a lot of people think they like. Some people like them. I try and talk everybody out of this one. Um, this is a mushroom set for setting flush rivets. So this is an example that came back from us from Oshkosh, so I take no credit for it. But um, this, this set would, would be used to set the flush side of flush rivets. And it has a, a socket and a ball here so that you can get the rivet gun angled a little bit and it still works. Now, think of back to physics class, and when you get your rivet gun angled, some vector of the force is trying to push the rivet set sideways. So what they've done is they put this rubber set on here so that the rubber holds it in place and it won't move around. The downside of that is that the rubber takes so much pressure to compress that you're pressing way too hard on the skins. Um, for instance, if I can make my fingers do this right for the camera. Okay, so, so here's a skin, and let's say there's 15 inches in between ribs or 12 or whatever. And so you push hard enough on here to, to get that rubber to compress. I'm, I'm not even touching it yet with the, the, uh, the metal part of the set, and you can see how much deflection is going on. So that's the first thing I don't like about this set. The second one is you put it down over the rivet, and you can't see where you're at anymore. So <clears throat> to combat that, they made this very flat. So instead of having a, a true mushroom, it's, it's very flat across the face. So you're beating on your airplane in roughly an inch of diameter here, where if you use <coughs> a regular mushroom set, now I'm just going to leave this in the gun. If you use a, a solid mushroom set like this, it's domed, so you're only really hitting an area that is about three-eighths of an inch, quarter to a three-eighths of an inch um, in diameter. Plus, you have the advantage of being able to look down between the set and the aluminum and see that you're right on top of that rivet. And then there is one in between, I'll just mention real quick, that is a rivet set with a rubber guard but does not have a swivel. So same, same problem, you'd have to push so hard to collapse that rubber. I wish there was a good way to show this on video, but um, you have to push so hard that you're really pushing too hard. You should only be holding enough pressure to keep the rivet set on the material. So, and that leads into the, the next thing I wanted to show is when you are riveting, you put the, the set down on the material, and then you should pinch it with your thumb and index finger and then push down on the material itself. So you're, you're capturing that set and not allowing it to move. So you're doing what the rubber set is doing. You're just doing it with the other hand. Now, a lot of people say, what if I don't have a building partner? What if I need to rivet by myself? And I urge everyone to find somebody that can, that can either run the rivet gun or buck the rivets because as probably several of you know, the actual riveting in an airplane is a tiny percentage of the work. Um, so what I've always done is just prepped my stuff and then set it off to the side until somebody else is around that can hold the bucking bar um, or do the riveting and I can hold the bucking bar. So I always work with two people. Um, that way you, you can do this. You can put your, your fingers on there, you can capture it, you can make sure it's square, and then you can hit the rivet because when you're trying to hold both, this probably won't work, but we'll try. If trying to hold both the gun and the bar, your focus cannot be on both at the same time. You can switch pretty quickly back and forth between the two, but you can't focus on both. And that's why the um, th that's why they made this because then you can focus on the bucking bar. But, again, you're just pressing too hard. You should only be pressing hard enough to keep the gun and the bar in contact with that rivet. Um, that leads me into the uh, back rivet sets. A lot of the stuff on an airplane, you can back rivet. And so 
all of the control surfaces you can back rub it and then you can even back rub it a lot of the um, uh, fuselage skins and wing skins and stuff so what the back rivet set does is you can put the back rivet plate in the table, you can lay your work down onto it, you put the set over the top, it pushes the two skins together while it's setting that rivet. So you have nice tight skins, there's no air gap in between. It sets the rivet and, <coughs> excuse me, it sets the rivet and it keeps everything exactly flat because it can't go beyond the plate. Um, you can't push too hard. Uh, so that's a very controlled way, especially to start and learn how to use the rivet gun. Now, we also have, and <clears throat> you may have seen the picture, um, we have an, a long back rivet set. And what that's for is for doing the top skins of wings because it's it's the same deal if you can keep the top skin flat and hit the hit the rivet from behind you're gonna have beautiful flat wings um, so that's what this buck, bucking bar is for is for the outside and then let me switch back to let me see if I can find it I think I may have closed it so bear with me just a moment. Okay. okay, so this is a couple that is up in Minnesota that um, he publishes his, his uh, work every night to YouTube, and so it's, it's little quick clips. I think it's one out of every 25 seconds it takes or 50 seconds or something. But I noticed this one day that he was he was doing the top of his wing skins and he was just raving at how, how great it worked. But he's holding the bar on the outside and his wife's running the rivet gun. And <clears throat> you, if, uh, if anybody's listening in with their wives that do the bucking, uh, you can mute right now. Okay, so anybody who's left listening. The bucking is the hard part, and the rivet gun operating is the easiest part, and apparently Colleen here has figured that out, so um, she's the one with the rivet gun in her hand, but um, it actually, if, if you're going to rivet with two people the uh, and doing it back riveting, then I would have the less experienced person holding the bucking bar in this case, but... Um, never knew about the mushroom sets. I just saw that, Andy, in your, in your chat window. Okay, so there was one more thing. Oh, I just wanted to show. Let me get the screen share back off. Okay, I wanted to show this fun little demonstration. It's always hard to explain tungsten bucking bars to people. So I came up with this visual representation here of the tungsten bucking bar. And so... Here we have, oh, it's out of the screen. Hold on a minute. Here we have a tungsten bar, and we have a regular footed bucking bar. Now this bar is a good twice as big as the tungsten bar, and you can see that the tungsten weighs more. So tungsten is 1.9 times as heavy as a regular steel bar, but you can see that it fits into much, much tighter places and... Uh, once you pick up one of these, it feels like it's melting rivets. Once you pick up one of these, you never use anything else. So that's what I wanted to cover about rivet sets and bucking bars. Um, so go ahead and ask any questions. So again, if anybody has questions, you can go ahead and open the chat window by clicking on the chat icon on the left-hand side of the screen. Excuse me while I get a sip. <clears throat> Good thing we started this because Oshkosh, I'd be, my voice would be gone the first day. Don, this is great information. Oh, good. Um, is there anything specifically, Don, that we uh, that you'd like to talk about? So are you just starting on, on your wings?
I'm going to switch cameras here while we're and and the rest of you guys, please um, submit some questions so we can have something to talk about. <clears throat> okay, so my detail camera back. I was also going to a lot of new builders. Um, don't quite know how the rivet length gauge works, so I wanted to cover that real quick. Um, this camera is not the best for getting details, but hopefully um, be able to see how it works. So this is this is just one single sheet that has a couple dimples in it. I'm going to put a rivet through here, and, and the rivet is supposed to be one and a half times the diameter sticking out from the bottom of the dimple. And what this these uh, notches in the middle do is there's a mark three, four, five, and six. I don't know if you can see that, but so I go from the bottom of the dimple to the end of the rivet and I can see that that's the right length of rivet that's going to give me the right result. Now this gauge is based on the ideal measurements. So this is one and a half times the diameter sticking up to make that. Um, sometimes you'll find that a little bit less will work. Sometimes you'll find a little bit more will work. I try and always err on the side of having the rivet too short because a rivet that's too long will, is very easy to smear over or bend over. Um, so then this piece that I've had um, it found in my toolbox from the air show has some rivets that have been set. And again, in this corner, it's labeled three. So this hole is one and a half times the 332nd diameter rivet hole. And then in the corner here, there's a notch that's half the original diameter. So the rivet should not go through that hole. Again, this is an ideal, so sometimes they pop through the hole, but then don't have any end play. Um, so yeah, I would call that good still. Uh, a lot of the rivets uh, that Van specs out in our, his kit are just a little bit too short. So you'll find that they pop through the hole and then just tiny, tiny bit of end play. But it's a good gauge. Um, and then the way you use the end is this will go either direction and it has a square hole in the end, and you just measure from the bottom of that dimple down to the uh, end of the notch. Which I know it's blurry, but um, the end of the notch, and that tells you if there's enough rivet tail there. If it's thinner than that, then it's not good. If it's too narrow, then it's not good. Um, so that's how the rivet gauge works. <clears throat> Looks like we've got another question, um, and actually, let's... Uh... Let's go back to Mark's um, initial question about uh, finishing the edges of skins. And, and Mark, I'm going to uh, go ahead and unmute you. Um, if you've got something specific about uh, edge finishing, um, let's, uh, let's bring it up. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. If you could um, click on the red microphone icon at the top right of your screen, that'll give you back the uh, microphone control. Okay, yeah, can you hear me all right? Yep. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, um, yeah, my question is, you know, the the skins are real thin metal and seemingly really delicate, and what what is your suggestion of the best way to uh, finish that? I've got a Scotch-Brite wheel, um, you know, Scotch-Brite pads. Uh, I'm just curious what your recommendation would be to, to just to make that so it's not sharp and show the shear marks. Sure. Remind me what you're building, Mark. Yeah, RV12. Okay. So the 12 skins are much, much thinner than um, what I'm normally used to working with. We did, you know, put that 12 together at Oshkosh last year, and so I have some hands-on with that, but they're, they're pretty thin. Um, what I would do... Bear with me, Joe. What I would do for some of that is to take the Vixen file, which is a curved tooth file. Can you mm -hmm. see that at all? Or, or, okay. Yep. So I, so I take, take the curved tooth file and I would, I would just pull it. Actually, that's what I would do is I would pull it down instead of pushing it. I'd pull it down the edge and, and knock off those punched marks that, that every three inches or so you get those punch marks in the kits oh, from there. Okay. See it punch. I'd knock those off first, and then I would just go on those thin skins, I would just go to the, the hand pad unless there's some kind of a big nick, and then if there was a, if there was a big nick that I really wanted to get out, then I would use the, the hooked blade tool, 
and then drag it along the edge just to pull those off of there, and then then scotch right hand pad. Okay. All right. Thick, uh, yep. any, anything that's twenty five thousandths or thicker, I would go right to the Scotch Brite wheel with and take it down, and then use the hand pad on the edge. Okay. 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 And then the hand pad, you just uh, hold it with just on your hand or with wood behind it, or uh, what? I just I just fold, I usually fold them in half so they're double layer thick, and then wrap them on the edge of the surface, and then just just run it back and forth like sandpaper. Yeah, just on my hand. Okay. I have Great. seen some people use those little foam pads, but it's too much for me to have to work with. I just fold it over and do it. So. Okay. Great. I, Thanks. I, I think in general, people people kind of overanalyze deburring. Um, it's especially on the twelve. They they say that on the twelve that you shouldn't have to do anything other than put it together. Now, hmm. I I'm not in that camp, but um, you know structurally. It's fine. I think on those thin skins, they're worried about people sharpening the edges and making a yeah. good place for a stress mark to start. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Good to see you. I yeah, good to be seen. <laughs> this is great. Great idea. I think this is awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Credit right. goes to Bill. Oh, sorry, Mike. I didn't mean to cut you off. That's what, that's what happens when you have people other than yourself that have the controls. That's right. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, yep. <clears throat> Andy had another question about draining the compressor tank. Um, he was if there's any solution once the tank is spraying out red sludge from the drain. Mm, um, it's just rust inside. Um, I probably wouldn't worry about it too much, just maybe drain it more often. Um, it's just going to rust inside. Um, the only thing I could think of would be to put put oil, you know, in there. Um, and, and blow it out, but no, nothing that I know of to do. Um, probably, probably drain it when you're done, though, uh, because the more it sits in there, the more it's going to rust. But yeah, it's just going to have some of that. We ended up putting a, we took the little stop cock off the bottom of ours here in the shop and put a quarter turn, uh, half inch valve, whatever, whatever that's called. So we put an elbow and then a half inch valve and then a and a pipe out through the side of the building, so we just kick it open and let it drain until you can hear that everything's gone, and then close it back down again. Okay, if uh, anybody has any additional questions, we'll make one last uh, shout out here to use the chat button on the left hand side of the screen and. Uh, Go ahead and type your question in, and we'll get it answered. Can they just unmute themselves as well, or do we have to? Uh, do I have to um, open it up from my end. Okay. So also, if anybody wants to ask a question um, live, let me know, and I'll unmute you. And so anybody that didn't catch it, the chat button is in the upper left-hand bar there. Okay, looks like uh, looks like we don't have any more questions. Uh, we're about 15 minutes early here, which is great. Um, I think this was a great first session. Um, Yes, Don. Um, <laughs> we definitely plan to have more of these sessions, and we want to do something new uh, every month. And uh, what I'd love is if uh, folks have feedback on topics that they'd like to hear more about, uh, you can uh, like us on our fa Facebook page um, and put your topics in there. You can email us directly, either mike at clevelandtool.com or bill at clevelandtool.com or you can go right to our Google Plus page and uh, this event page, and we'll be sure to get those topics from, uh, from the event page. So uh, it looks like Ronald has a question. Um, how loud is the building process? I plan to build in a condo that has a garage. It's a great you question. You need to make, make friends with the neighbors and get them on board. That's uh, <laughs> hey, check this out. This is what I'm thinking about doing. You you want to learn how to rivet and get them excited about it, and then it's not going to be a problem. Um, the uh, the C frame 
to, to dimple the um, sheets. Basically, all the sheets in the airplane are dimpled on a C-frame or a tool called a DRDT. Um, the DRDT was actually invented by a guy who's in your same situation. He, he was building an RV4 in his garage, and his neighbors were complaining about how loud it was because it's, it's the loudest tool. Um, you hit it with a hammer, it makes a big clanging sound. So, so he made this lever-operated tool, and it's a, it's a massive 65-pound beam, basically, in a C-shape. And it has a toggle link mechanism on there, so it's pushing, pushing down um, and trying to spread this, this uh, C-beam out. But it doesn't make any noise. And so, so that's why, yeah, Andy says he loves it, and it's quiet. So that's why this was done, is so that you could do that. So then the only thing left um, that really makes a ton of noise is, A, the air compressor. Um, and I saw you bopping in and out on the chat. Did you, uh, Michael, did you hear, oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. Ronald, um, did you hear about the different tips for making the compressor quieter? Uh, because that's, you know, really toning down that compressor is, is the, uh, is a big key because because it makes a lot of noise. So the best thing you could do for a compressor is you could find an old one out of a hospital or a auto repair shop or something. The the ones from 50 years ago will just go thump 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 really quiet. Um, the new ones are just screamers. So one of the things I had mentioned, and you can go back on YouTube and watch this, but real quick, one of the things I mentioned is um, that if you take the pulley off of the motor and put a bigger pulley on it and then a, a belt to match, you can slow your compressor down from a 11 to 14 CFM compressor to something that, that is really more appropriate, and it really quiets it down by the tune of at least half. Um, and then you can build boxes around it and stuff to, to make it quieter too. So that's probably the second loudest tool, and then the riveting process, um, that's something that, that you, again, is a small percentage of the, of the work. So um, just timing it, you know, so it's a Saturday at noon when, when you, you know, you hear the neighbor's skill saw outside and go out and, and rivet the thing together, take two hours and your, you know, your horizontal stabilizer's done. So uh, you can work around most of that noise issue that way. Um, if you need any follow-up to that, go ahead and, and type it in. I'd be happy to expand on that. Um, stay away from the oil-free compressors. Yep, there, that makes noise. Uh, edge forming tool, what's the best way to tell the right pressure to set it at? Perfect question. Um, let me see if I have one. It seems like, yeah, I'll be right back. Um, we, we had... Uh, pulled one of those out of our demo box the other day. So I'm going to run and grab it. I'll be right back. All right, so I'm going to switch back to my other camera here. A few clicks. And to set the edge forming tool, there may be a YouTube video on our, our YouTube about this too. I'm not sure. Let me try and get this right here. You see there's a, there's a line where this top roller goes from being flat to having an angle on it. You want to put it on the sheet. Hmm. It's like trying to cut your hair in a mirror. There we go. You want to put it on the sheet so that it's not up on that, that uh, angle. And then you want to tighten the screw down until it's just snug. Just, just, it just stops. You don't want to bear down on it too much. Then take it off of the material and maybe an eighth of a turn, maybe a little bit less than that, and then lock the nut down here. Then put it on the edge, not clear up at the end, but down a ways, and pull it toward you so that your, um, 
this flange is angled in just a bit. And that'll keep it up against the edge. Then come back to where you started and then just push it off for that last inch or so. Um, then so my, my, I'm just going to interrupt real quick. Uh, you said an eighth of a turn, um, and I didn't catch which direction that was. Oh, yep, sorry, good point. Um, it's an eighth of a turn tighter, and I did it too much. Um, you always want to practice on a piece of scrap. I, th that was too much. That was too, too tight. But what you can do is you can take a straight edge, I would normally use a, a little square or a ruler or something, but this is in front of me. Um, I just can't get a good shot of that. But it should just, there we go, it should just leave the um, straight edge just slightly. Because all you're doing here is you're just you're just tightening it down so that when you have a row of rivets here, well, here's a good example. When you have a row of rivets here, if you don't do that, it'll be tight where each of the rivets are, and then there'll be a little bit of a gap. Um, like that, where the rivets are not. So um, that's why you do this, but you really don't want to see it. Let me see if I can get the light to reflect right. You can see that this one's done. Boy, it's hard to get it to hit right. This one is done, but it's just just enough to be noticeable, not just enough to work here and keep it tight, but not enough to be a a crease like this. So, like I said, do it on a scrap first, but I would go back now and I would put this on the same thickness of material that you're going to do and then just back it up a little bit, a little looser, and then tighten the locking nut back down. And then, I'm not going to be able to do this very well because there's dimples, but and then you'll have less of a bevel in it. Does that answer your question? Looks like he said yes, and okay. then once it's set up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. And uh, another little caveat to that tool is it's really designed for um, 20 and 25 thousandths material. You can you can use it on stuff smaller or thinner. You can use it up to 32, but it's really you really have to fight it. Um, so 20 and 25 thousandths, and yeah, once you get it set, it's. It's very consistent along the whole length, like of a trailing edge of a wing skin. Um, that you don't have to hold an angle. All you have to do is keep it on and uh, keep the flange on the the edge of the material, and it it does all the work for you. Okay, it looks like uh, we've got a couple questions here, and we've got about nine minutes left, so uh, it should be just about enough time to wrap these up. So. The first question is from Mark. He asks uh, if he needs to add oil to his Taylor Riveter during the build of his 12. Uh, that would be the pop rivet tool. Um, there is a neat video on, well, I think that might be on adjusting it, though. There's a neat video on Taylor's website about that tool and how to adjust it. Most people, that would be a good topic um, for another Hangout, too. The uh, most people don't adjust that right. There's a double nut inside of the pop rivet puller, and you should be adjusting that double nut so that as it pops, as the rivet pops, that nut is almost up against the stop, and then it will just go click. If it's recoiling on you, if it's coming back at you, the tendency is to then slam the tool back into the material because. You're, you're pushing on it, trying to keep that rivet tight, so then it recoils and you, you hit it. Um, so if you adjust that double nut, it, it'll change your life. It, it is really nice to use that tool. As far as the oil, the only time you should have to add the oil is if, if it's you know, leaking a bit, using a bit. But um, Well, I've had one for 20 years, and I've never put oil in it. So I, I just, just figured out lately that, that you could do that. So or I, I took one apart to see how it worked. Um, okay, it sounds like uh, Donald had missed the part about the tungsten bucking, bucking bars. Um, so if you just want to demonstrate the, the weight piece again, that's good. Sure. Um, were there any other questions before I switch cameras back? I'm, I'm glad for all the interaction. This is great. This is what I was hoping for. So. 
Thank you, guys. All right. Um, what I did here is it's really hard to show somebody what something weighs, right? So I just put, well, am I in the screen this time? Nope. Um, there you are. Okay, so here is the footed bar, and here's the tungsten bar. And you can see that the tungsten bar weighs about the same as the footed bar. Maybe just a little bit more according to this, but look at the size of them. So you can get the tungsten bar in a ton more places than you can get the footed bar. This is probably twice as large um, as far as volume, because this is the tungsten is 1.9 times as dense as steel. Plus, these are all cast, so there's air bubbles in them. So you can get these in, in tight little places, and, and like I said before, once you use one of these, it's, you never use anything else. Um, with people buying new kits that are just starting, I, I tell them these two bars come in the kit, and I tell them, you know, take these out, they're $20, $30 a piece or something like that, and where this is about 130 so there's a huge price difference, but you'll end up with half a dozen of these for getting in different little locations, where this, I, I haven't found one yet that it doesn't work in, you know, unless it's too thin here or something, but it's well worth the money. Um, it's the only one you need, the only one you use. Yeah, we do have plans for more of these. This is uh, this is this is the fun part of my job, and and technology is improving to the point that hopefully that we can we can be a little more interactive. So appreciate you coming. Any other questions? It looks like uh, looks like that was it. So. I'll just close really quickly here. Um, thanks, everybody, for, for joining us. Um, great to meet some of you, and I know that we're all looking forward to seeing you at Oshkosh if you're, join if you're going. And uh, we'll, like I said, you know, be sure to put uh, future topic ideas in to any of our social media sites, uh, the Google Plus page. Um, you can email us. You can put it on Facebook. Um, definitely just let us know what you'd like to see, and we'll be sure to get it on the docket for future, uh, future sessions. Uh, so thanks everybody again for joining us and Mike if you want to say anything to close out yeah I just want to say thank you for for taking the time to to do this and it's been fun and um, yeah please send us your suggestions so we can keep it up and uh, tell your friends you know especially people that are that are just starting it's uh, you know the, the culture has changed so much to um, we, we don't get together at shows and things like that as often, and, and it's always good to, to be able to leverage a technology like this to, to solve that. So it's, it's exciting for us. And uh, I know there's, there's one of our Twitter followers that's in Saudi Arabia, and he, he complained on Vans Air Force once that um, it was you know, hard, to, hard to show people something. You know? I have this problem right here, and so this is pictures worth a thousand words, videos worth a thousand pictures, I think. So thank you all for coming. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.